friends, uh, welcome again. We are continuing the series of uh, interviews for the Retosa Family Summit in Dubai. And uh, we have uh, with us today Bruce Porter Jr. Um, Bruce, welcome. And please tell us a little bit about yourself, what inspires you in life and uh, what brought you here? Sure, absolutely. Well, I, I'm an early uh, Bitcoiner. And um, so I've been in the, been the thing for quite a while. The uh, UAE has really opened its doors to all of us, providing a uh, very nice regulatory environment for us to grow our companies. And of course, uh, Sir Anthony has done such a great job of curating a wonderful group of people uh, in order to, uh, for us to also uh, you know, work our, our different companies. I, uh, I own a company called Global Boost. We started a blockchain eight years ago. It's still around, it's a mineable currency. Also, Washington Elite is one of our brands. Uh, so we'll be doing interviews here as well. Um, and uh, we do events and that. But the biggest business right now is really uh, consulting. So I consult early stage technology startups, which is another reason that brings me here to Dubai. Uh, they have stayed open while everybody really has been closed and provided direct access to government leaders and decision makers so that you can really make things happen. Yeah, I totally agree. Here in Dubai things move really quickly and uh, they're open to uh, newcomers and especially for the uh, new technologies that can change the world. And how, in your opinion, um, the blockchain can change, can help the society? Well, we're going to talk, uh, really honored to have a fireside chat with, his, with the Archduke, who I know you guys have already uh, interviewed, Sander Habsburg. And then of 30 or 40 minutes after that, we do the monetary revolution. And it's something that I talk about uh, quite often. My friend Nick Spanos will be on the panel as well. He's the one who coined the phrase. Apparently, people told me after I was going around saying it. Um, but we already have changed the world. And, um, you know, it took... It took five years for the governments of the world to realize what was going on, but we do have a revolution. It's a monetary revolution. And, um, you know, I, I, it's almost amazing that it has been able to happen because, uh, you know, so much business has gone away from these traditional groups, banks and everything else. Uh, you have something with uh, this technology, blockchain technology, that you can really own. Um, you can keep it, uh, you can keep the seed phrase in your head and you know someone can actually take the physical card or whatever that it's on but if you don't want to give them the seed phrase you don't have to, you can put a gun to your head and you don't have to do it and it's really kind of the first time in the history of the world that that's happened and so the dynamic has changed and you see it happening throughout Central America now, uh, Central and South America, it's going to continue to happen. Um, we have, of course, the U.S., my home country, printing up all kinds of money and now really trying to put a lot of regulations and everything in place. But uh, this, you know, it's, uh, it's like the tide, you know, it's, it's hard to go against the tide. And when you have a movement like we've had in Bitcoin, there's, it's the tide is going. And um, so, of course, we all want to work with everybody and make everything as, as good as possible. Again, Dubai offers us a wonderful place to do that. But uh, we will continue changing the world. And people like I'll have on the panel, the Archduke, uh, President Vitt, who started his own country, uh, Dr. Marwan, who is here in the government. You know, these people have been pivotal in making this all happen. So that'll be at 1045 tomorrow. I hope uh, people can watch. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. And you know, uh, when you said that, uh, like it is uh, interesting how th the revolution uh, was allowed to happen. Maybe it is because it is an evolution, you know, uh, not so a revolution, but an evolution. And in this regard, uh, do you think that uh, people were uh, longing for more transparency, more openness of also the information? because? One of the things that uh, blockchain technology allows is uh, the transparency and the traceability of all the information and immutability of data. So uh, do you think this is something that people were looking for also uh, like from there's, this point of view? There's no doubt about it. You know, you have uh, something that is 
uh, public ledger. It's there, and that's uh, you know one of the reasons why uh, Sander Habsburg, the Archduke, and I signed an agreement four years ago to use blockchain for philanthropic work worldwide. And that has been one of the, uh, the pivotal uh, points in my career that, that changed a lot of things for me and opened a lot of doors uh, to be able to work with him like that. But the reason that that happened was because blockchain provides a way that is immutable and transparent and in a place where, you know, philanthropy, there's, you know, hard to track the money sometimes and we both do a lot of philanthropy work, charitable work. Uh, it's so important. And, um, and that's something as well, even when you go back to printing the money. You know, you have uh, the governments of the world just kind of uh, deciding to spend stuff and then printing the money. Well, where does that money come from? Well, you just got diluted. You know, how much money do you have in the bank? Well, now it's, you know... Well, your were... buying power is uh, diluted. It's just of, been taken away from you, from, of, from the people. Of course, yeah. yes. And that's, uh, you know, think of it as a stock. I mean, people don't really understand it. Uh, but if you have, you know, 100,000 shares of a stock, and you're holding a, you know, a percent of them, and they all of a sudden print up 500,000 more, well, what just happened to you? you know? and, and that's what we're continuing to do over and over again. And I don't know if it will collapse. I think it must collapse at a certain point. I don't know when, if it'll be soon or far from here. Uh, China has done a great job, though, of propping up the economy uh, for years, so it remains to be seen. We're in uncharted territory. Wow. Yeah. Can you talk about the philanthropic uh, projects uh, you have been involved in? Absolutely. So I, one of the uh, early stage uh, technology startups that I'm working with right now is Evay, Evay.io. Yeah, we interviewed. Um, uh, yes, <laughs> we interviewed our CEO Matthew yeah. Dixon, yeah. Uh, who is a great guy, and um, they are using AI and machine learning to uh, rate cryptos to start with, but we, we can use these rating systems across any type of asset. Um, they are registered here in the DMCC, which is a free zone provided by the, uh, by the government. By government. And uh, we're now working, I am working very closely with my friends here in the government to get the fund license. So it will be the first crypto fund to come out of Dubai. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, very nice, very nice. And uh, how, uh, in your opinion, can this uh, help uh, like uh, society in general, or uh, what, what is the benefit for uh, uh, people around the world? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do something I don't normally do. I'm gonna circle it back, and then I'm gonna okay. come back to that. So first of all, I wanna talk about how it can help the family offices. And so I, I've been said a few times that uh, crypto went directly from retail investors to uh, institutional investors and it really left a lot of the family offices behind and you know now we have a situation where of course they're eyeing it but nobody wants to get in at the top or you know like you're looking around and then which one to invest and then it's hard to pick it's hard to vet the teams it's hard to do all these types of things so again with something like eBay where the fund is across multiple different assets. Uh, this is a good situation for the family offices to be in. And that's one reason why uh, after connecting with Sir Anthony uh, earlier this year here in Dubai, I've really uh, come full force here. Now to help uh, the, the world as a whole, I mean, there's no, um, the amount of charitable work that has come through the blockchain is astounding. You know, you can, uh, you can rally the, the crypto spear as I call it, and get them to donate their crypto and everything else. And I mean, another uh, example of it is, of course, the Ethereum uh, founder Vitalik uh, donated, like, you know, I don't know, a ton of Shiba, which, you know, of course, upset a lot of investors, but a ton of Shiba uh, token to uh, some relief. But that type of, uh, that type of work is kind of synonymous uh, with the blockchain. So not only are we providing a transparent, and, uh, and trackable way to do things, but for the most part, we're, we're really putting our money where our mouth is. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, maybe the most important thing is uh, that uh, the, how the money is spent can be traced, right? right. It's uh, the transparency of this which is important because we all know that a lot of uh, organizations that are saying that uh, they're doing something for the world and they're amassing vast amounts of uh, money from the states and everything 
and then still we have uh, unsolved problems. I mean, you know, for the same amount of uh, money uh, the Red Cross is uh, leveraging, we could build a pipeline with water to Africa, you know. Uh, and uh, so this is why I think that the uh, crypto sphere can uh, add transparency, much needed transparency, and allow for the funds really to reach the final destination. There's no doubt about it. And the other thing I would like to mention is that it has provided a framework and almost a common ground for us to interact with world leaders. And uh, a lot of that is timing, of course, right? I mean, that may not be the same five years from now, but over the last five years, uh, being at the forefront of this monetary revolution, of this blockchain, uh, I have had direct access to, to world leaders and been able to make those relationships and capitalize on those relationships. And you know, in the end, it was like my father who spent two tours in Vietnam uh, fighting said, you know, in the end, we all want the same thing. And, uh, and that's something I tell a lot of Americans as well, because most Americans don't travel. And so we get kind of a sighted viewer and we only see one thing. But in the end, we all really want the same thing. You know, we want uh, to have a family. We want a safe place to raise them and for our future generations. And so that's um, being able to work with the world leaders on that level uh, has been an amazing thing and something that, uh, that it really opened those doors for a lot of us. Bruce, uh, I really uh, love what you just said and you know, uh, we are also conducting this interview in the framework of uh, the Creative Society project on a lot of TV. This is the main project and it started 10 years ago. Uh, we've started uh, interviewing people uh, all over the world, uh, asking them what is the world that you would like to live in. Uh, there's also uh, there's a film made which is called Universal Grain and several parts, hours and hours of, you know, uh, people saying exactly the same thing, that what unites people is love. Right. And uh, everyone said also we, during these interviews and social surveys that uh, we all want the same thing. And uh, it is the value of human life, which is the first uh, foundation of the eight foundations of the creative society that were distilled statistically from these responses of people all around the world. Everyone wants a peaceful society with no wars, transparency of information, uh, health care and education for everyone. And this is really uh, something that is near and dear to our heart and I'm very glad that uh, you told, spoke about it. How do you think uh, it is important for people to unite and to speak openly about these things to you know, erase the boundaries and uh, really get together to solve all the crises that are uh, happening all around the, us? Well, of course, it's, it's just so important, um, you know, to that dialogue and that, uh, that conversation and that understanding uh, that we all, you know, really want the, really want the same thing is um, what can propel us and what will, has always propelled, uh, you know, peaceful societies. And, Excuse me, we're in a moment right now where, you know, the world is kind of, it's a bit crazy, you know. Um, to be honest, I, I like staying out of the, United, the, the U.S. I, I, it's, uh, it's we have a difficult political situation. Uh, you have one side that doesn't, really doesn't like the other side and the other side that really doesn't like the other side. And then you have some people in between. And the truth is, the vast majority of people are in between. But you have the loud people over here and the loud people over here. And so that dialogue is so important. And um, you know, I've, I've often said that uh, if the US is the melting pot, then Dubai is the crossroads. And Dubai is the crossroads of the world. And so for everybody to be able to come here and to have that dialogue and to see everybody living together and working together is, is an amazing thing. Yes, and I totally uh, agree with you that uh, the lack of dialogue and even people um, not allowing themselves, themselves to think about how we can live all together and that basically there's all the divisions are just in our head and for the most of part, part they were not uh, you know, uh, <laughs> being built by people themselves. They were just you know, somehow imposed on the society and uh, just speaking about openly about things that are important for, to everyone makes us understand that we are one and this is very important. Thank you Bruce. Awesome.